Let's pray together. Father, we thank you very much for your great love for us, which has never ceased. From eternity past, you knew us, and you knew the decisions we would make, and you knew how you're going to show your love for us. We thank you, and we thank you for this opportunity to be here right now and worship you. Enable us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's have a Let's start off with our memory verse. Psalm 119.10 I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Psalm 119.10 Okay, now, I'm going to talk about fossils. You can see it, different kinds of fossils here. I'll pass this around so you can all look at it. Here is a, a trilobite. That's a creature that lived in the sea. Um, here is a shell. And here's some small things, all kinds of stuff. This is a, a bone of an animal. Now, so let's take a look at fossils. Many people think fossils have to be really old. It doesn't take that long to make a fossil. In fact, the concept of a fossil is anything that used to be living and has left an imprint of itself. And uh, it could be as simple as a dinosaur walking down a path and he has footprints there. And then if they're quickly covered over and turned into stone, that's a fossil. Or it could be, uh, I saw a crab one time and its little pinchers were out here like this and it was solid stone. Although I wondered when it had been made stone. I wasn't sure if it was a recent fossil or an old fossil. It can be bones of an animal that have turned hard. If I put my feet in concrete and leave an impression, technically, and that dries, that's a fossil, technically. It's something that used to be living that left an imprint of itself. Okay, it could be a leaf, could be grass, could be a worm, could be a dinosaur. And many people think that fossils take a long time to make but they really don't. For instance, if I were going to make a modern day fossil, I would use cement. How long does it take for cement to dry? At least a day? Well, you could say a day. Actually a few hours, but if you want to really have it set up hard, you'd let it alone for at least a day, and maybe more. I know with some bridges, when they pour cement on the bridge, they'll leave it alone for maybe two weeks, and they'll go out and they'll water it, and they keep trying to cure it. So it it uh, dries out real slow and it's a real strong bridge. Here is a hammer with all kinds of stuff attached to it that fossilizes it. Well, it's, that wasn't even a living thing. The hammer is just a tool. But the same type of minerals that are in water and different things, they'll seep down and they'll get in. And if, if I were to be fossilized, all these little minerals would seep down into my body and they'd get into all the little holes all over me. Uh, there are holes all over us. Uh, we're not solid and such. And the, all that mineral would get all over my body and it would turn me hard. And then people that, that used to think that it was hard would say, yeah, I was right, it was hard. Now there have been people that were buried in graveyards but it was so wet, they thought, well, maybe we break Grandpa out of that wet area. And they dug him out, opened it up, and he was fossilized. Because the water brought minerals, some sand, and some, oh, some iron, and different things, and it replaced the places in the body. For instance, if you had a sack of flour, and it got buried in water, all the little minerals would start going in between the pieces of... Uh, a flower and pretty soon it'd be a hard sack like a rock but there'd still be flour in there so you could probably still smell if you hammered it you could still smell the flour but it would be a hard sack because it's starting to get fossilized 
So, it doesn't take too long to make a fossil. They've had things accidentally become fossils in just seconds. When lightning hit, and it hit uh, some roots, and it just fossilized them immediately. That's unusual, very unusual. But uh, something can turn a fossil in weeks, in months. Um, it doesn't take hundreds of years. It doesn't take millions of years. Uh, it can happen pretty quick. Okay, we're going to see a lot about fossils. Uh, dinosaur, a lot of dinosaur bones have become fossils because with Noah's flood, the flood that God made at Noah, during Noah's time, the water covered over uh, this stuff real quick, and then it started to harden. So, does it take a long time to make a fossil? Yeah. About 60 years. Uh, no, it doesn't take long at all. It doesn't even take 60 years. It could be real quick or, or a long period of time. Most dinosaur bones, by the way, are bones. They're not fossils. We think of them as fossils. They're not. Most of them are just bones. Okay. Psalm 119.10. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Psalm 119.10. Let's pray. Father, help us to see around us what your word has taught us. That you really do act in the world today. You judge the world. You judge in the past with the flood. And you bless the world with many, many good things. Help us to see you and all we see around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, without Bible teaching, the soul, it is impossible to please God. For wherever would drop drop, ah. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists as a rewarder and becomes a rewarder for those who seek Him. Let's seek the Lord in the book of Amos. That's your challenge of the day. The book of Amos. Right after the book of Joel. Amos chapter 1. <clears throat> the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. Okay, let's have silent prayer, confessing any known sin, preparing our hearts for intaking God's Word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to take in a little bit more of your word and make it a part of our thinking. We ask that you would do the great work of drawing us on to Christ's likeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During the days of Jeroboam, Amos was a prophet. We've seen the prophet Jonah. He also lived during the time of uh, Rehoboam the second, or excuse me, Jeroboam the second. And gone the second just because he had the same name as the original Jeroboam. They're two different men, two different kings of Israel. Now Israel has been divided into the northern tribes, basically ten tribes of Israel. Israel, it's called, in the southern tribe, which is basically Judah and some of Benjamin. And these are two distinct countries. 
both Jewish but distinct and is split apart as part of the discipline because Solomon forsook the Lord toward the end of his reign. And this was part of the discipline. Now, in the northern kingdom, none of the kings ever measured up to what God had in mind. Everyone were called evil. Everyone were bad. And yet, most of them, from the information we have, were believers. But they just never would let the politics be an aside in their life and follow the Lord and politically do what they should do. There are many people, you know, there's so many people who have been presidents of the United States who say they were Christian. And we at times say, really? You do that and you're a Christian? Because there should be a difference, not a strangeness, but a difference. Truth, integrity should rule a believer's life. Uh, and you shouldn't play politics, although it would be almost impossible to today in our climate. Amos was called of God during the time of Jeroboam. Uh, so was Jonah. We, we saw Jonah. He was a reluctant missionary. And Amos, he was a farmer. Uh, he took care of uh, some herds. Uh, he took care of some sycamore trees, which are not like our sycamore trees. The sycamore trees that they have in Israel are fruit-bearing trees. And what they would do is, uh, ever so often, they would get at a certain time when the tree was de the fruit was developing, they'd take a, little, a sharp little type of a needle or something, and they would poke the fruit. If you know anything about worms and apples, this is the same concept. When the blooms on an apple tree come out, the little moth comes and lays a little egg in that bloom. And when that bloom is fertilized, it closes up and starts to develop an apple. And the worm inside it hatches and starts to eat its way out. So worms don't eat their way into an apple. They're eating their way out of an apple when a worm is found in an apple. It's the same way with the fruit of the sycamore tree in Israel. They would puncture <clears throat> the fruit so that the worm would find an easy way out. It wouldn't chew up all the fruit. And that was just a way they could preserve their fruit as for the harvest that's going to come later. So he had some fruit trees. He had uh, uh, some flocks and herds. He was a farmer which answers the question, can a farmer be a believer? <laughs> yes, should be. Every job that God gives us, no matter where it is, no matter what we're doing, if we're driving a truck, if we're uh, playing in the dirt as a farmer, if we're raising cattle, it doesn't matter what it is, can be used of God to the glory of God. Every job. If we didn't have Christians in certain jobs, well, where would the integrity and righteousness be in those jobs? What we need more of is people who are CEOs, heads of companies, uh, who are dedicated to serving God. They would do the best possible for their workers because that's what the Scripture tells them to do. We can't leave the business world and the farming world to unbelievers. People will cheat. When the Roman Empire... Had a lot of people who were believers the first uh, years. And many of those people worked for Rome, worked for the government of Rome, and they did their job right. There was corruption. Of course there was. There's corruption everywhere. I don't care where you go. There are some preachers who are corrupt. There are some businessmen who are corrupt. There are some contractors who are corrupt. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't have anything to do with me. I do it right. I'm determined to do it right as it should be done. I do it as unto the Lord. I know that I'm not serving people. I'm serving the Lord. And so we do it right, no matter what our job is. Amos did his job as unto the Lord. He was a farmer. And God called him one day and said, I got a message for you to deliver to the northern kingdom. Amos wasn't a professional prophet. He wasn't one trained 
in the school of prophets. But let's just take a little look here at Amos, a little bit about him. In Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7 will give us some insight into him. And one of the first passages I ever memorized uh, uh, was from this. The old King James says, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. That just stuck with me for some reason. Chapter 7 of Amos, verse 10. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel. Now, the priest of Bethel is a false priest. He doesn't teach God's word. He, he teaches false teaching. Uh, uh, your, your good can outweigh your bad. You can be good enough to get to heaven. Just offer the right sacrifices and buy God off. And Bethel was one of the main headquarters of the false religion of the northern kingdom. <clears throat> Sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all these words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Now, he quotes part of the message of Amos. He says, now this is like insurrection. Uh, he is speaking against you. You need to get rid of this man. In any country, if you speak the truth, you're going to be resisted. I don't care who you are. You don't have to be a prophet or a preacher. If you say the truth, you'll be resisted. Um, that happens in our society. Uh, there are hundreds of churches that don't teach God's Word, but teach what is tickling the ears of other people. What they think might be interesting or acceptable to other people, they teach. Well, and so they're not going to appreciate hearing what God has to say, because God's ways are not our ways. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. <clears throat> and that's true. It's a temple of the northern kingdom. It's God's false place. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with God. The king made Bethel this center of religion, but it had nothing to do with the living God. It was man's religion. Man's religion always says, look what we can do for God. Won't God be impressed with what we're doing? Won't he be impressed with our sacrifices? Won't he be impressed with my work? Friend? Won't he be impressed with the thing I'm doing here? And Christianity is totally different. Look what God has done for us. It's not look what we're doing for him. It's look what he has done for us. So he's told to shut up. Don't talk anymore. Don't preach anymore in this area. Now, Amos is just a farmer. But he's called to give a message to the northern kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. This is common in many lands. For instance, if, we, if I were to go to Canada, we think of Canada as kind of a neighbor, kind of ally type of thing. If I spoke any word against homosexuality, I'd be put in jail. Because that's the law in Canada. You cannot speak against homosexuality at all. No matter what the Word of God says. No, that's not allowed. That's a law in Canada. Well, what can you say? It happens everywhere. When people don't want to hear what God says, 
they pass laws contrary to what God says. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Uh, now, Amos is going to give a special prophecy to the man who resists God's word. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Quite a stinger there. Your family is going to be destroyed because you made a decision against God. And all of the wealth you gathered, this, this prophet was a head prophet. He had lots of land, lots of wealth. Uh, it was very profitable for him to be uh, a prophet for the king of Israel. That's not always true that people prosper being a preacher or an evangelist at all. But this man prospered greatly in a false religion. But his land will be divided up, his wife will be destitute, his children will be killed, and he'll die in exile. That's pretty stern. Let's go back to the beginning of Amos. We need to take a look at Amos because there's three sections to the book of Amos. Verses 1 through chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2. It's the burden that God has for the nations round about Israel and Israel. Now, Amos uh, starts at the out, outer rim of Israel and he goes around and he starts mentioning the na nations and how they have wronged, been wronged in their attitude and in their uh, efforts uh, against their fellow uh, people in the land around them. That Damascus did certain things to its neighbors which God does not like. That God says is unacceptable and they'll be punished for that. The Gaza the Philistines, they have done certain things that were wrong in, in their attitude. We'll see those. And he has a regular formula for saying this. This is what the Lord says in verse 3 of chapter 1 of Amos. For three sins of Damascus, that's just north of Israel. Even for four, that's his formula that he gives. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. God is saying I'm going to punish them because of what they've done as a nation. God judges nations. Now we don't know what's going to happen in Cuba. I have my doubts that they're going to get their freedom because they have a communist regime that will kill as many people as they need to to keep power. But it'd be nice if they could gain their freedom. We certainly know that Russia, Venezuela, China, they don't want to lose Cuba as a communist nation. 90 miles from the shores of the United States. The people would love to have freedom. And God sees what rulers and nations do to their own people and what they do to others. And God does judge nations. One of the great judgments we've seen in our own lifetime in the last few years is the judgment on Syria. Syria was totally devastated in a civil war. What did the people want? They wanted freedom. What did the government want? They wanted to stay in power. And God does judge nations. He judges uh, Venezuela. The richest country in South America, bar none. The richest. Now they're the poorest. In, in one generation, from the richest to the poorest, totally poverty ridden. And they are also those that are walking, traveling, to get into the United States. I think I've mentioned to you before, my son used to date a girl from Venezuela. Um, and she talked about her relatives, and when uh, Chavez got into power, 
uh, all her relatives took all of their wealth, sold everything they had, and all their golds, all their silk, all their money, and they went to the United States because they knew what would happen to Venezuela. And it went from the richest to the poorest nation in South America. And that's a judgment. Do you think calamity comes to a nation without God being aware of it and God being involved in it? Because God will judge nations and individuals, families, tribes. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. Gilead was the northeasternmost part of Israel. And they came down and devastated the Israelites in that area, like taking a, a, a plow and tearing up the ground. I will send fire on the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. That's the leadership of Syria and Damascus. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Aven, and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile in Kerr, says the Lord. That will be Assyria to the north. They're going into exile. The reason they were destroyed as a nationality is the sin that they caused against Israel. Now, it goes on uh, to the coastland, um, verse 7, verse uh, 6, excuse me. For three sins of God, say, even for four, I will not relent, because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. I will send fire on the walls of Gaza. I will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod. Gaza is a city of the Philistines. They had five major cities. Gaza and Ashdod were two of the major cities. And the one who holds the scepter and Ashkelon, another major city, will turn, I will turn my hand against Ekron, another major city, till the last of the Philistines are dead. This is the complete annihilation of a nation says the Sovereign Lord. And indeed, the Philistines disappeared from the pages of history after a great deal of wrongdoing done to Israel. They would capture Israelites when they were fighting others, when they were trying to defend their home. They would capture the innocent. Well, you know how it is. Anywhere you have great warfare and civil war, there are thousands of refugees who leave to try to get away from the murder and carnage that takes place. And as these refugees who are Jewish were trying to get away from all the destruction, they would capture them and sell them into slavery. And for that, God says, I will judge. For three sins of Tyre, now that's northern coast, that's what we would call Lebanon today. Tyre was a very famous, highly fortified city. Uh, they thought it was indestructible. You, you couldn't destroy this city. Uh, but it laid, for hundreds of years, it laid completely devastated because of this prophecy. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent, because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom. Edom liked to take people and enslave them. And they sold many, disregarding the treaty of brotherhood. Tyre and Israel had a long uh, treaty of friendship and uh, uh, help in each other. Um, David bought all of the materials of the great uh, cedar trees and stones and, and used many of the skilled artisans to build the temple. He had it all gathered so when Solomon took the reign, he would have everything ready for him to build the temple. And for a long time they were allies, but now, not now. I will send fire on the walls of Tyre that will consume her fortresses. For three sins of Edom, 
Now, Edom is the southern part, what we would call Jordan, the southern part of Jordan today. Even for four, I will not relent, because she pursued his brother with a sword and slaughtered the women of the land, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. I will send fire on Teman, capital, and will consume the fortress of Basra. It's also called in Scripture Petra. That is where Jesus Christ will land in His second coming and march toward Jerusalem from that place called Basra. This is what the Lord says for three sins of Amnon. Even for four I will not relent because she ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. In other words, the Jewish women of Gilead. That was a place that had tremendous pasture and they had lots of cattle in that area. And uh, they wanted to take the land of Israel and make sure no Israelite was going to live there. So every woman they found that was pregnant, they would rip her open and kill both the child and her in order to extend his borders. I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah. That is the capital. That's, a, that's where the capital of Jordan is today. That will consume her fortress amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. And then in chapter 2, it's for three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent. You notice he's talking to Gentile nations here and how they respond to the nations around them and what they did, righteous or unrighteous. And God judges nations because of their evil and the evil that they thrust on neighbors. Because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king, I will send fire on Moab that will consume the fortress of Kirioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. I will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with her, says the Lord. Success in battle doesn't always depend on who has the most soldiers or the most weapons, but it depends on the Lord. The Lord can condemn a nation, and it doesn't matter how great their army is, they're going down. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent. Now notice we're getting closer to home here. Now we're at Judah, okay, the southern kingdom. Even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord. What is their great sin? They rejected God's Word. They didn't have time for God's Word. They didn't want to read God's Word. They didn't want to have anything to do with God's Word. And the only thing that makes us different than an unbeliever is God's Word in our soul. That's it. That's all. That's what makes us different. We're told not to conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds as we take in His Word. That's what makes us different. And Judah didn't want to be different. They want to be just like the other nations, rejecting God's Word, not even knowing God's Word, and acting like the Gentile nations. And not keep His decrees. His decrees tell us about the character of God as revealed through His Word. Because they have been led astray by false gods, they rejected the true God, and once you have rejected the God of the Bible, the God of creation, there's a vacuum there. And man is incurably religious. Man is going to worship something. And once you've tossed God out the door, you're going to worship something. You're going to take some other false God. And then you're going to have false teachings. And then you're going to have a false life. The gods of their ancestors, their ancestors followed. I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortress of Jerusalem. And indeed, it was the Babylonians who destroyed. It was, all these others were destroyed basically by the Assyrian and then the Babylonian Empire. And in verse 8, this is what we're getting to, what Amos is there to talk about. 
This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver. January 6th, a lot of people marched to Washington and they foolishly went on the cap went to the Capitol. They entered the Capitol. None of them had weapons, okay? It's not like this is a revolution, they're over the government. None of them had a weapon with them. But they were doing wrong. Most of them were there just looking around, seeing what's going on. They weren't actively engaged in anything. Over 400 of them now are in jail. They have not been put to trial. They have not even been accused yet. They are sitting in jail. And they'll still be in jail till next year before they're going to have a trial. There's nothing right about that. Israel would do anything it needed to do to enrich itself, give itself more power, give itself more prestige, put silver in its pocket, sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. I guess they had designer sandals like we have designer shoes. I need new sandals. I need better sandals. And so to get that, they would oppress people. They would steal from people. People who didn't have the resources to defend themselves. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and they deny justice to the oppressed. In our country, the idea is everybody gets a fair shake before the law. That whether you're rich or poor, the law is supposed to be blind. It just weighs the facts. Unfortunately, that ideal isn't always realized. And in many countries of the world, it's the rich who oppress the poor. And that's the way with Israel. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. Their immorality is a direct affront of God's rules. They lie down behind every altar. This is sexual immorality around their worship. On garments taken in pledge. They would take a man's robe, say, well, give me your robe as a promise that you'll pay back this little loan I'm giving to you. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. Yet I destroyed the Ammonites, the Amorites before them, though they were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. He said, but did you remember that I destroyed the Amorites, wiped them out. When the Israelites came into land, and they said, oh, there's giants in the land. There's all these people. We can never defeat them. They're so strong. They were all wiped out. I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. And I raised up prophets from among your children. The Nazarite, well, <clears throat> Nazarites were very different people. They were men who never, ever had their hair cut. And the best they could do is braid their hair and wrap it up under the turban because that was just unheard of in Israel to have long hair as a man. And they had long hair and everybody knew what a Nazarite was. This was a man totally dedicated to God. And what did the Israelites do to these men who from uh, early years dedicated themselves strictly to God as a Nazarite. They forced them to drink wine. A Nazarite could never have his hair cut. Remember Samson? After his hair was cut, he lost all strength from God. They were never to touch or eat a grape or a grape product or wine. And they forced these men to drink wine, mocking their service to God. 
So, let's go down to verse 13. I will crush you as a car is crushed when loaded with grain. Overloaded and it just breaks down, falls apart. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. And the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warrior will flee naked on the, that day, declares the Lord. Far, that's, that's far enough for now. We're going to see that God judges nations. We as the United States of America are not going to escape judgment for our wrongdoing. The only hope our nation has is the nucleus of believers who are growing. God will honor a nation if there's enough of a nucleus for the believers to preserve the nation. It is the remnant He is calling out. Let's pray. Father, we'd like to be the remnant. We would like to be those who preserve the nation that we love. We realize there's a lot of evil going on. There's a tremendous amount of crime going rampant. There are many, many victims of crime. And there are many victims of, of rioting. Father, it doesn't even seem like the same nation anymore. Uh, we are still fortunate we live in an area which is, has relative peace. And we would ask that you would protect us by your wall of fire. That you would take our lives and let us live that we may grow in your word so that you could take us as people who have preserved this land and continue to make it a beacon of hope for many people in the world and a place where the word of God goes out that people may know our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper emphasizes continually to us, look what God has done for us. It's not about what we do for God. It's never about what we do for God. It's about what He has done for us. Turn to page 332, please. Can you see both verses? Standing on the second verse, please. Receive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Lord, we're truly thankful for a time that you redeemed us. You went to a cross, a cruel cross, where many things took place on that day. Darkness, an earthquake, a temple curtain being torn from top to bottom. Truly a great time. And we are remembering this for the redemption of our sins. Be with each one of us as we truly give thanks for what you've done. These things we'd ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now the fun part. We get to go before God's throne of grace and let our requests be made known. What a privilege that is. It's interesting in the uh, book of Amos, it talks about some terrible disasters that God has in mind. It says, I'm going to take and I'm going to swarm a tremendous locust plague over the land. And Amos says, oh Lord, please don't do that. And the Lord says, okay, I won't do that. Do you realize what power your prayers have? Then he says, okay, I'm going to take fire and I'm going to have an uncontrollable fire rush through the land and destroy it. And Amos says, please don't do that, Lord. And God says, all right, since you ask, I won't do it. Do you realize the prayer of a believer has great impact in the plan of God? Now, God knows all we're going to pray about, and He is brilliant in out finessing us. He can take even the evil that people do, such as crucifying Jesus Christ, and turn it into the salvation of the world. What a privilege to pray. Any, uh, we have our prayer list. Are there others that should be mentioned? Yeah. My mother in law, Lita Holloway, is having her knee replaced tomorrow. Where? At St. Francis. Anyone else? All right, let's pray. Father. We come before your throne of grace. We are your children and you listen to us and we thank you. You have never turned a deaf ear to us, but you have told us what you require. You've told us how much you love us and what you'd like to do with our life, giving us good and not evil all the days of our life. And we thank you. We praise you for the kindness you're showing to us. Let's give our thanks to the Father. And let's confess any known sin. Now let's take a look at our prayer list and start praying for some of these people and circumstances. You know far better than we do, Father, the pain and the heartache in these lives. We ask first and foremost that people might come to know you, the only living God, through Jesus Christ. That their life might have the abundant life given to them. That they might be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Take away the hardness of heart and replace it with a human heart of consideration of wanting to know the things of God, of saying yes to Him. You know the physical pains and you can solve that. May your perfect will be done in each life. Now let's pray for our family, each one by name for God's blessing.
Thank you, Father, for the gift of our families. May we be a encouragement in our families. May we be a light in the dark world for our families. May our homes be safe places. May our homes be places where the love of Jesus Christ is shared. Thank you for those you have given to us. Let's pray for the three people you're praying for their salvation. Thank you, Father, that you are working on their salvation, that we have very hardened hearts, that we seek other gods, and yet you're always calling, and you never stop. Thank you. Let's pray for our president and our country. Us, Father, how to teach love and replace the hatred and bitterness that's being taught. Teach us, Father, how to have a divine viewpoint of life which makes so much sense in relationship and contrast to the human viewpoint of life. Teach us, Father, how to communicate in a respectful way with others the hope that is within us. Thank you. Take us, Father, in the jobs you have given to us to be a Christian at that job. And may that have such a different <coughs> impact on the world that we'll get that taste of the heavenly gifts which you have in mind for us. May we indeed apply your word to the workplace. Thank you, Father, that you love us, you care for us, you're going to take care of us, and we can trust you. We ask you to help us live each day for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have all of these nations that God says, yes, I will judge you. I know what you're doing. And then he gets closer, gets to Judah. You guys are the custodians of my word and you don't even like my word. You don't want it. And then he gets to Israel. He zeroes in on his target. Israel will be the first to go into captivity, but not before they get a thorough warning from the prophets of God. And they warn Israel, not because they hate Israel, but because they love Israel. Let's sing our decision hymn together. Please turn your books to page 543, please. And we're going to sing all three verses, please. Let's all stand, okay? <laughs>
Indeed we will. From Psalm 73, 23, and 24. Psalm 73, 23, and 24. I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Psalm 73, 23, and 24. And this week, I will be faithful to my spouse. I will speak the truth in love. I will be courageous and kind. I will be thankful. Let's pray. We thank you for your word, Father. It gives us great encouragement that justice will be served in this world and in the next. And we can depend on you, the just one, for this. And we thank you that we can live for you in a lost and dying world. And because of the lostness of neighbors, that doesn't mean we have to act or live like we're lost. Help us to live for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.